Hello, how you doing? Welcome back. You know what time it is. It's Mass Extinction Series time. And this time I've got a big one for you. If you thought the last ones were bad, buckle up. It's gonna be a buffy one. <laughs> this one might just change your perspective on the planet in a neutral to good way, I think. The Permian Extinction, which happened about 252 million years ago. This is easily the worst mass extinction to impact life on Earth that we know of. This was a dramatic bow to not only the end of the period, but also to the end of an era, an actual scientific era, a bigger chunk of time than a period. All the other periods that we've talked about so far have been nestled into the Paleozoic era. The Permian extinction marks the end of it, the end of the more alien world. But first, let's get the general information out of the way. Extinction is a fact of life on Earth. The planet is always changing, and not every species can handle the changes. It's pretty normal for a handful of species to go extinct each year, but a mass extinction is a different story. When huge changes cause tons of species to disappear in a relatively short time all over the world. These events are horrifying, but also cool to study because we get to learn how our world got the way it is now and also where it's headed. Right now, rates of extinction are so high that we might be on the verge of a modern mass extinction. Experts predict that if this trend continues, we could lose up to 50% of all species on Earth by 2050. Throughout Earth's history, there are five famous mass extinction events, the big five, and in each one, more than 70% of life on Earth has died out. In this series, we're exploring the causes and effects of the big five, one by one, to lay out what we know about mass extinctions of the past so we can prevent another so now let's get into episode three, the worst mass extinction of all time, the Permian. <laughs> The Permian period is the time span between around 299 to 252 million years ago. It is the sixth and final period of the Paleozoic era, just before the start of the Mesozoic, the age of reptiles, dinosaurs. <laughs> At this time, almost all of Earth's land masses were joined together and you guessed it, supercontinent Pangaea. Surrounded by one world ocean, Panthalassa. How heinous. Pangaea was a wild place. It had a vast region of dry inland desert, and it experienced what scientists call a mega monsoon climate. Living on that supercontinent were some of the earliest known complex land ecosystems. There were lots of plants, including ferns, conifers, and more. Glossopteris is one of the most famous fossil trees of all time, found on several modern continents. And actually, the wide distribution of this plant was one of the first clues that led paleontologists to realize that the continents used to all be connected. These vegetated habitats were home to lots of land invertebrates, early insects, spiders, and millipedes, plus some of the earliest reptiles, small lizard-like species, but also big cow-sized species like Scutosaurus, named for the scoots all over them. There were no mammals yet during the Permian, but ancient cousins of mammals were super successful. There were little cynodonts like Procynosuchus, sail-backed pelicosaurs like Dimetrodon, one of my personal favorites, massive herbivores like Cotillorhynchus, whose ribcage looks like a tunnel system, and the saber-toothed, predatory, Gorgonopsids. Absolutely sick. Meanwhile, the oceans were home to lots of familiar faces. Bivalves, lamp shells, and corals, alongside ancient groups like trilobites, sea scorpions, and spiral-shelled ammonites. The Permian period and the entire Paleozoic era ended with an extinction event so bad that it's been nicknamed the Great Dawn. Around 90% of all species went extinct at this time, and up to 95% of species in the oceans. This event completely reshaped Earth's ecosystems. It was the worst mass extinction event in the history of our planet that we know of. But as we know by now, a mass extinction doesn't happen for no reason. Toward the end of the Permian period, geologists noticed major changes in the distribution of fossils and also in the chemical makeup of minerals in rocks and seashells. These changes all point to major disruptions to Earth's systems, including ocean chemistry, carbon cycling, and global climate. If you've been watching this series so far, you'll know that with earlier mass extinctions, it can be tricky to figure out exactly what triggered the environmental changes that led to extinction. But this one is much more straightforward. In modern Siberia, there is a massive assemblage of basalt rocks, the cooled remains of enormous lava flows that spread out over a million square miles. This formation is called a large igneous province, evidence of thousands of years of volcanic eruptions, and these lava flows date to the end of the Permian period. Volcanoes mess with the environment in a bunch of ways. For one thing, they release lots of dark sulfurous gases which can build up in the atmosphere, blocking the light and heat from the sun. Enough of these gases can block so much sunlight that global temperatures drop. Cold climate messes with temperature-sensitive plants and animals, and it causes sea levels to drop as lots of water gets trapped as frozen ice. But volcanic gases are also full of carbon dioxide. CO2 is colorless, so it doesn't block sunlight, but it is a greenhouse gas, so it traps heat in the atmosphere. If volcanic eruptions continue for a long time, like thousands of years, like these Permian volcanoes, CO2 builds up in the atmosphere until those cooling effects are offset and the world warms instead, melting ice and raising sea levels. Based on the extent of the volcanic deposits, scientists estimate that those Siberian volcanoes released several thousand gigatons of carbon into the atmosphere. If you can't imagine how big a gigaton is, me neither. 
it's a lot. Life on Earth is great at adapting to changing environments, but it can only handle so much so fast. And at the end of the Permian, these volcanoes were causing massive, rapid changes in temperatures, light levels, and sea level. And those gases caused even more problems beyond that. As carbon dioxide dissolves into ocean water, it causes the water to become acidic, which makes it harder for marine animals like plankton and corals to build and maintain their shells and skeletons. As the ocean's temperature and chemistry change, this also affects how the water circulates. Oxygen enters the ocean from the air above, and if surface waters aren't mixing properly with deeper water, the deep water has become deprived of oxygen. Permian-aged rocks are full of minerals that develop in high sulfur, low oxygen conditions, evidence that these ocean habitats were experiencing chemical chaos. Some of those volcanic gases also mix with water vapor to form sulfuric and nitric acids that fall to the ground as acid rain, which can be harmful to plants and animals on land. And certain volcanic gases are able to damage the ozone layer, which protects life on Earth from dangerous radiation from space. The easiest way to get a mass extinction is to destabilize global ecosystems, and they don't get much more destabilized than this. Chemical changes to the oceans, atmosphere, and soil, plus fluctuating global temperatures, plus the rearrangement of habitats as sea levels change, and also maybe high levels of radiation, it was a bad time to be alive on this planet. As plants and corals died off, forests and reefs and other habitats collapsed, leaving nearly every species on the planet struggling to find safe shelter, clean water, and sufficient food. It was a worldwide ecological catastrophe. But it turns out the Siberian volcanoes might not be the whole story. There are massive Permian lava flows preserved in other parts of the world, including South America and China. It's possible that these eruptions were contributing to the atmospheric mayhem of the time too. Some researchers have also suggested that the warming of the oceans might have led to the melting of frozen reservoirs of methane that built up beneath the sea floor. Methane is an even more powerful greenhouse gas than CO2, meaning it's even better than CO2 at trapping heat in the atmosphere. There's some evidence to suggest that things got as bad as they did during the Permian extinction because methane was melting out of the ocean floor into the water and seeping into the atmosphere, causing the global warming of the time to be much worse. Paleontologists and geologists have spent a lot of time studying the Permian extinction because it was massively important to the history of life on Earth, and because there's lots of great fossil and rock deposits from the time that can help us understand what exactly was going on. On top of that, this is an incredible case study for what happens when you pump gigatons of carbon dioxide into Earth's atmosphere. It's like a giant flashing warning sign from the past. Eventually, the volcanic eruptions ended and environments began to recover. By then, almost all of life on Earth had been wiped out. Comparisons between fossils from before and after this event show a worldwide loss of around 90% of species. Habitats all over the world were completely destroyed. This event extinguished many of the animal groups that had been widely successful and ecologically important for hundreds of millions of years. Trilobites and sea scorpions disappeared completely. So did tabulate corals and rugose corals, the major coral groups of the Paleozoic era. Some previously outstanding groups, like sea lilies and lampshells, almost went the way of the trilobites. And even though they did manage to survive, they've only been minor players in ocean ecosystems since then. Recovery from this extinction took a really long time. In the geologic record following the Permian period, scientists have identified what they call a coal gap, meaning there are no coal deposits. Coal forms in vegetation-rich environments like swamps and forests. The coal gap lasts for several million years after this mass extinction because there were apparently no major swamps or forests for several million years. It took that long for these environments to return. During that same time period, there's also a coral gap because there were no major coral reefs for several million years either. Post-Permian ecosystems are extremely low in diversity. The ancient mammal cousin Lystrosaurus is famously found all over the world after this extinction because it's one of the few successful survivors. The world after the Permian extinction was a depressing place. No forests, no reefs, and barely any biodiversity left. But eventually the world recovers, even from the Great Dine, and a new age of Earth's ecosystem begins. The Mesozoic, Lystrosaurus and its relatives give rise to mammals, while reptiles become wildly successful in the land, sea, and air. And soon the age of reptiles is in full swing, until the next mass extinction. This is the third episode in a six-part series on mass extinctions. Make sure to follow the Colossal YouTube channel for the next episode, where we're going to explore the mass extinction that kickstarted the age of the dinosaurs, the Triassic extinction. See ya!